Hi everyone, this is our first presentation on the Cold War. And so throughout this, we're going to see a lot of changes, not only in uh, the uh, international uh, foreign policy amongst the U.S. and the changes throughout the world, but we're also going to see a lot of changes at home when we talk about uh, the Cultural Revolution, otherwise known as counterculture. Um, <clears throat> this picture is very telling. This is a U.S. Navy testing of nuclear weapons. Um, here we see that you have some abandoned ships out there. Don't worry, people aren't in these. And they're testing uh, a nuclear weapon to see the effects on if this is used, uh, say, in times of war. So nuclear testing is now supposed to be extremely internationally controlled these days, though it still goes on uh, here and there in rogue states. So, Cold War. Um, we're just generally going to throw out a ballpark number from 1945, the end of World War II, to 1970. Um, of course, the Cold War does go on beyond that. And some people say that the ghost of the Cold War still lives on today. But we're going to end it about 1970 because after 1970, we're going to start with our final unit. All right, as is our norm, we have our terms to know. Um, <clears throat> if you already know what one of these terms means, you're fine. But if you don't know, please try to commit it to memory because this is going to help you navigate some of the future content within this unit. So our first term is containment. Policy based on preventing territorial acquisition by communist nations. So what we're talking about here is setting up buffer zones, um, uh, helping out countries that are friendly to us, but uh, will, in a sense, make a border between, say, especially Europe and uh, the USSR. All right, communism, uh, economic, political, and ideological system characterized by totalitarian government, control of property, and forced religious views. Of course, it goes way beyond that, um, and of course, there's different kinds of uh, communism as well. So, um, e even even the phrase to call someone a Marxist is more complicated than that, because you mean like early Marx or late Marx, you're talking about his students, you talk about Leninism, Trotskyism, all that other stuff. But we're not concerned too much with that, we're just looking at the bare bone basics. Um, Vietnamization, Ugh, don't like that word, policy uh, for South Vietnamese troops um, for the, to fight the war in Vietnam as U.S. troops withdraw. So what we're talking about here is something that um, we attempt to do as a nation every time we go to war with another country. As we try to, uh, the goal, the stated goal is to stabilize them ensure that they are friendly to us, and then hand off uh, their policing and their military and their government back to them. If you remember, we did this in Iraq and Vietnam, and both may have had uh, some parallel results. Counterculture, when people take on lifestyles that differ from the mainstream culture. So uh, we're gonna see this a lot. Um, a lot of it's going to begin in the universities and spread out from there. Yes, you have the cultural revolution. Um, you have uh, the sexual revolution. And we'll talk uh, a bit when we get there. This is mostly going to be a discussion that's going to start for us in the 60s. Though you could definitely say that this is it, that it actually begins earlier than that. All right, more on terms to know. We have two more. We have the silent majority. Um, so this is going to fast forward to the Nixon era, but it's still going to be helpful for the unit. President Nixon's reference to people who agreed with his policies but did not voice their opinions in public. This is used time and time again uh, in presidential races where you it's, it's used to explain sometimes why polling is inaccurate. Um, whereas 
people may have certain opinions, but they just don't feel like getting into uh, a political argument or being stigmatized and things like that. So they keep their opinion to themselves. But because we have secret ballots in this country where you can vote, but people aren't supposed to be able to look over your shoulder and check who you're voting for, people might not vote the same way as they voice their opinion. All right, domino theory. Foreign policy, which stated that when communism spread to a new nation, that it would then cause their neighbors to convert as well. This is a, a big fear. Um, of course, we're going to see this in Eastern Europe in Asia, in Latin America, um, this is this is a, a big fear because you have in a lot of poor countries um, a lot of people who are desperate and uh, they don't always have places to go to help themselves. So socialism or communism seems like a likely candidate. In some places you have violent revolutions um, that might be funded by foreign nations. So. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about that and uh, perhaps the CIA's involvement as well. <clears throat> of course, uh, during this time, Europe is going to be split, uh, specifically Germany. We're going to talk about Eastern and Western Germany. And, uh, of course, it's going to be symbolized mostly by East and West Berlin, which this picture is taken from. Oh. Here you see uh, barbed wire all strung up like Constantino wire. You have, um, gosh, I forgot the name of that arch. All right, so what is this unit about? The Cold War is a time in U.S. history that was defined by the strong tensions between the Soviet Union and the United States. Of course, it's going to spread on beyond that. So it's not just the Soviet Union and the United States. So they were the superpowers of the time. You also have Britain. You have much of Europe. On one side, you also had, uh, of course, China on the other side, and eventually Cuba. And you're also going to have other places that are going to have their own socialist um, leanings that are going to be um, seen as very dangerous by capitalists. Generally, this era starts at the end of the Second World War and into the 1980s. Key points in this period is the creation of NATO, the Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, MAD, which is an acronym that means Mutually Assured Destruction, Proxy Wars, The Space Race, The Red Scare, and Changes Within American Culture. And so if you're not sure, a proxy war is when you have two major powers um, have armed conflict, but not directly. Let's say you have your friends fight for you, and your friends fight their friends. And this was important in the context, well not important, but it was significant in the context of MAD. When you have nuclear weapons that many feared could destroy all life on Earth, you didn't want these two superpowers to fight, but they still had conflict. So they had smaller nations who weren't capable of nuking one another fight instead. <clears throat> Alright, so if you please remember this guy on the left, uh, lighting up a cigarette, that's Joseph Stalin the leader of the Soviet Union, and this fellow standing right next to him, that's President uh, Harry Truman. Remember, he was the vice president under FDR, but when FDR died in office during World War II, Truman is going to become president. And so Truman also not only has to pick back up uh, command as commander-in-chief of World War II for American forces, he's also going to have to take care of a lot of reform policy. So, post-World War II, uh, some of our differences between FDR and Truman is that FDR seems to have had a policy where he wanted to bring the Soviet Union into the fold of the nations. He thought that maybe if you brought them in economically, if we made alliances with them, that Stalin uh, might not be such a bad guy. Truman, on the other hand, thought he was a thug and thought that the Soviets were going to be a very poisonous force in the world. So following World War II, America followed the ideas of the Atlantic Charter, which outlined two necessities for world peace, international cooperation and deterrence through military strength. This is something that uh, is still part of U.S. policy today. So um, 
as, it, as, it, as the old adage goes, um, gosh, uh, if you want peace, prepare for war. I'm trying to remember what it is for Latin, but uh, sorry. All right, so this required America, for America, to accept a leadership role among the world's nations and to station military forces throughout the globe. So um, this is often seen as a modern interpretation of imperialism where you don't control countries directly or anything like that, but what you do is you station uh, your military and your businesses throughout the world for influence uh, economically and kind of almost, some might say in a threatening way, however, in other, another interpretation would be, well, actually, you're keeping peace. Pirates out of the ocean, making sure nations don't have needless wars, things like that. Um, <clears throat> The Soviets, however, wished to also be seen as the imminent world power, to see Germany reduced to a minor country, and to have friendly governments installed in their neighboring countries. So, um, the Soviets did not trust um, Western powers. Uh, some of that has to do with communist doctrine. Um, within Marxism, you have the big idea that a lot of things that come about have to do with class conflict, and not just class conflict, but also uh, government-style conflict. You, you can't have, say, in the Middle Ages, you couldn't, say, have uh, some of the new bourgeois people who were out there making money within the towns uh, live the same lifestyle as feudalist. So there was big conflict there. So. They're saying here you have capitalist countries, which they saw as backwards and regressive, could not live peaceably with socialist countries, which they saw as uh, kind of like a government evolution. So, <clears throat> and Germany, they wanted revenge. I mean, Germany was blamed for two world wars uh, in the eyes of the Soviets. And of course they wanted uh, buffer zones themselves. Truman pointed out that the Soviets were forcing communism on other countries. The Soviets said they were encircled by capitalists, and they felt threatened by it. However, uh, we will see that there are adequate examples where communists will invade countries and install governments that are friendly to themselves. So that's going to end it for today's lecture. I'm going to go ahead and stop here, and we will pick up next time and see where this goes. Thank you.